Admax RT family. Uh, we launched this family in October last year, and uh, this is the first crossover processor for the industry. And it has a high performance Cortex M7 running up to 600 megahertz. Um, um, let me show you that how we make that this great chip out. So you know we have uh, an IP. We have uh, two uh, families of the processors. One is Atomax, which is a Cortex M8, a Cortex A class, and we also have the microcontroller uh, with the Kinetis and the LPC, which is with Cortex M cores. So these two different families. Um, are uh, working for the customers require performance from Atomax and also require the ease of use and RTOS from the microcontrollers, which is Kinetis and uh, LPC from NXP. So we have both experience and we integrate the best of the both worlds to one chip. It is Atomax RT. We call it crossover processors, which has both the performance and the ease of use and real time. So finally, RT is a chip that with Cortex M7 and also with 600 megahertz performance, which is much higher than the highest one in the industry nowadays with Cortex M cores. And also RT has uh, the real-time performance, short latency, ease of use, and RTOS support, which, um, which is uh, very um, normal and uh, very usually in the microcontroller families. So this chip is as best of the both world. How can we make this chip? So we leverage our experience from the Atomax, which is application processor. Um, so we architectured the Atomax RT from the Atomax architect. And also we integrate the peripherals from the Atomax and the controllers from NSP as well. So you can see from this diagram, we have the TCM, L2 catch, and also other peripherals, security, and we integrated the DC DC PMU into this chip. So with this great chip, uh, it has the capability to target to a lot of applications with the performance and ease of use. So it can um, fulfill requirement for the applications from audio subsystem, consumer and healthcare, home and building automation, industrial computing, and mode control power conversion. So what is the RT highlights? You know, RT1050 is the first RT part we launched. And uh, we have other RT families we will launch this year. So you will see some of them in the coming slides. So what is a highlight on the first RT par RT1050? Um, so as I said just now, RT1050 has a high performance, the real time processing, um, 600 megahertz M7. So it is 50% faster than the current M7, all the M7 products. And it has 20 nanosecond interrupt latency, and it has 512K TCM shared with the uh, SRAM. And also it has low bomb cost. So we, um, so RT1050 is starting from less than $3 with that high performance. So the 2.98 dollar and 10k resale and it also can um can give the benefit for the bomb cost from high integration of the pimic with dtdc and the low cost package 
is 10 by 10 BGA and uh, enabling four layer PCB design, which is uh, with lower lower cost. And also RT1050 has a lot of memory interfaces like SPI flash, NAT, and uh, EMC for NOR. So um, also it has, uh, RT1050 has a high level integration. So it has uh, security uh, with AES-128 and HAB and uh, on the fly QSPI flash decryption, 2D graphic engine and uh, parallel camera interface, LCD controller, audio interface. So um, we integrated almost everything needed for the industry. And also it is very easy to use, which um, we have the tools IRKO and MCU Expresso is a NXP um, tool chain. And also we uh, have the free Atos support. We have the uh, SDK and ARMBED. So the, the global ARM ecosystem, which uh, the developers and the customers uh, have been using uh, for a long time and very familiar with. And also this chip enabled a single voltage input supply. It's very simple and easy. And also has the scalability to the current Kinetis and Animax and LPC uh, product from NSP. So um, you can have the detail features of this chip from the diagram here. So from memory side, we have the, the patch and the TCM, fractal KTCM, and also we have the multimedia peripherals, which um, is uh, optional for some part. You will have the part configuration in the coming slides. And also we have uh, quite a lot connectivity features like SD, MMC, UART, and keypad. I square C S P I I square S speed diff can and two USB OTG and the Ethernet. The analog side we have ADC and the comparator. So uh, this is a very powerful powerful part with the uh, uh, high speed core and also um, a lot of uh, on chip features. So we have two uh, device options or configurations for RT1050. Um, RT1051 is a part that uh, without graphic, without CSI and LCD, and RT1052 is uh, the full feature part with everything. So we have a uh, two tier of the, the part, one is a uh, uh, industrial, which is from minus 40 degrees C to 105, and the uh, consumer part is 0 to 95 degrees C from temperature side. Now, so we are uh, delivering delivering uh, a lot uh, a lot of uh, enablement from uh, NSP and also our partners to support the customer. Uh, project development. So uh, we have runtime software, um, Atos, so, and uh, uh, solutions from uh, our partner like Crank and other partner list here. And also we have the software development uh, tools, um, MCU Espresso, IR, Cal, Embed, and Sega. Hardware development tools, we have the evaluation kit from NXP and also some uh, kit from the partner solution. And also we uh, we are delivering some application specific um, solutions or support for uh, applications like graphics, HMI, uh, camera mode control or voice activation, audio, etc. And also connect from the connectivity side, 
Uh, we have uh, solutions for the wireless connectivity, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and the wired uh, Ethernet, CAN. So um, for the support, you can get uh, support from NSP uh, very easily from the NSP.com. And we have a NSP community, which is a very good site to support customer questions. We have uh, many engineers working on this uh, community and answer the questions from the customers every day. And we also have uh, uh, professional support of services from NSP that can deliver a service uh, uh, with paid for the dedicated uh, requirement from the customers. Special. So, um, RT1050 has the the development uh, platform, which is EVK, we call it. Uh, so we have two versions of the EVK, uh, the EVK-B and EVK, uh, which is version, version A. And the uh, EVK-B is recommended for the uh, new uh, opportunity uh, as we uh, made some uh, optimization or update on the EVK-A version. And uh, we have a display which has a uh, LCD panel uh, working along with uh, the EVK. So on the EVK, you have uh, almost every uh, peripherals or resource on the chip. Uh, you can use with the, the onboard uh, the peripherals. So we have the onboard memory, um, SD RAM, uh, hyper flash, and uh, um, socket for the SD card and the QSPI flash. And uh, we support the display LCD and the camera connector. Uh, audio side, uh, there's onboard uh, codec and uh, uh, audio headphone jack and the speaker connection and the microphone speed lift connector. Um, also, we have the USB connectors, Ethernet. Uh, we have the onboard CAN transceiver and uh, Arduino interface, which can be a very good extension interface. And there's onboard debug port, and uh, we have several sensors on the board as well. So this board, this EVK, is uh, a four-layer PCB, four-layer through-hole PCB. Uh, with uh, the BGA uh, Adamax RT1050 chip. So it is a, a kind of good approval uh, proven for the four layer PCB design with this uh, high performance RT chip. So we have uh, the hardware design guide on nsp.com, which customer can refer to. And so the last uh, minutes, I want to update you with uh, the, the coming RMS RT uh, part. It's uh, RT1020, um, which has some changes from the RT1050 we have now. But the point here is that RT1020 is going to deliver the LQFP options, the low cost LQFP options for the customers. Um, and we have seen that a lot of customers uh, have been requesting KFP package for the RT. So let's see what, what's on the RT1020. So it is running up to 500 megahertz and with a 16K byte uh, I cache and D cache, and also 256K byte SRAM or TCM on the chip. So it's a half of the SRAM on the RT1050. And uh, uh, less of the flex uh, PWM and timer ENC, and one uh, high-speed USB, and uh, no uh, graphic or LCD or camera interface on the RT1020. So we are trying to make this part a low-cost option uh, in the whole RT family that can provide the customer a uh, more cost-competitive part. Although RT1050 is already a very good 
uh, cost uh, efficient part. Okay, so the other diagram shows the detail feature that I think is very similar to the last slide, the previous slide I showed, the feature set. So it has two packages, 144 FLP and 100 FLP. And RT1020 has its own uh, uh, EVK, uh, which is two layer, real two layer PCB design. So um, we also have the hardware design guide we release with this part and customer can refer to how to design this part for the two layer PCB and other hardware recommendations. So where uh, and when you can get the RT1020 uh, materials. So we would release, uh, we will not release, but uh, we will kickstart our alpha program for RT1020 uh, in March. So uh, about one month in one month with some earlier samples and uh, documentations to support our of customers. Um, and uh, this part will be launched uh, in June this year. So you can have everything that time. In June, have the documentation, have the uh, the, the part sample, uh, can apply it on the web, an sp.com web, and they have all the tools enabled for this part. So we call it a uh, full launch for this part, RT1020 in June. So, um, Thank you. I think uh, this is uh, all from me today to share with you the RT family, Adamax RT family. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so now I'd like to take a couple of moments and talk about a bit about the state of the industry and UI. Um, so these days, people are no longer comfortable with the traditional user interfaces and basic systems that they've seen in the past. And everyone's really expecting, as we know, the experience that they get on their expecting the experience that they get on their mobile phones and their tablets. Um, and that's really what they're looking for in everything they touch, whether it's a home automation system, their thermostats, their ovens, and their appliances. So you really need the high-powered uh, tooling solutions to allow you to develop these experiences you're looking for. And not only that, but the processors to make it real. Um, traditionally, what had to happen is customers would have to jump up to a higher level MPU system. And there, they would be extra cost and performance in order to get these experiences. But now with parts such as the RT, they can get the higher performance they require to allow the experiences. But yet, they still need the tooling solution side. Um, traditional tools at that level of the MCU were basic graphics libraries and very uh, minimalist tool chains. However, with Storyboard, what you're going to get is a high-level tool that allows you to build uh, custom user experiences very quickly, very fast, animated, but still target the MCU level processors and platforms and achieve the performance you want. Um, you really get one tool to do your high-end and your low-end platforms. So there's a lot of information on our website regarding um, what Storyboard can do, what the feature sets, lots of videos on our YouTube site. So I thought it would be easiest if I just jumped right into a demo instead of going through all the slides. So what I'll do now is I'll jump over to uh, our storyboard development tool. And in this development tool, you'll see here, uh, it's immediately available. And what a lot of people do is they'll start with an import from Photoshop. So you may have a UI or a UX designer, and they're developing your content somewhere. So they may develop that in Photoshop. And traditionally, you would have to cut these assets up on your system and have someone place them, and that's time consuming. So what we can do is we can directly import from your Photoshop file. So what I'll do here is I'll browse, I'll select a file that one of our designers created for us for a coffee machine. Uh, I can quickly hit finish. And what you'll see is in a matter of seconds really, we've pulled the Photoshop file in and you have all of this content immediately available to you. All of the screens that the developer created for you. We've cut it all apart into all its relevant pieces and bits. So all the building blocks are there and it's ready for you to use. 
So now what you can do is you can quickly add some behavior in and go from really a design into a working application in a couple of minutes. So first we'll look down at our UI, and this is really our start screen, so we'll make that our start page. So in Storyboard, the way you would interface with it is we have an action and event model. So that's what event causes something to occur. So in our case, we're going to say when we press on the start button, I'm going to fade an animated transition over time to my size screen. You can give it a duration. You can give it a target frame rate. You can customize easing rates for the animation. We'll hit finish. Next, I'll go to my size screen. And I'll say when I select on any of these sizes, again, we'll do the same action to make it easy. We'll do a press, we'll fade, and we're going to go to the brew selection screen. Finish. Now we'll find our brew screen that we're at now. Again, very simple, press, fade. Now we're at the final brewing screen. So just with those couple of actions and events, we can now simulate on our desktop. We'll save it away. And now you'll see on your desktop, I have the UI running. I can select start. I'll select my size. And now I can walk through. So you can see in a matter of a couple of minutes, you can go from a Photoshop design from a UI developer. You can add some uh, events and actions and get a flow going. And you can actually run this application. This is running on your desktop platform. If you wanted to test it, you could put it out to an Android device, you could put it to iOS, and you can even put it down to hardware immediately. There's no changes that have to be made, and that's something I'm going to do a little later in this demo. So another power we have is animation. So we've discussed what everyone's looking for when they touch their device. Everything should be moving or animated. So we have the ability to very quickly do animation, and the easiest way to do that is we put it in this animation record mode which really allows you to visually do what you want and achieve the animation. So we're going to say when we select on the small cup, I'm going to slide all the other cups off. So I can start by sliding down the large cup. And then I'll say that's my first frame, so I'm going to snap that. We'll select our medium icon. Again, I slide that off the screen. And we'll make it very simple. We'll say I'm done. I can give this a name. We'll call it cup slide. And again, as I stated, you can give it a target frame rate. We'll use 30 in this example. I hit OK, and what you've seen is we've populated this animation timeline. We have the two steps here, the durations, the rates. So all we have to add in is how do we cause this animation to occur. So if we go back to our small cup, previously we did an action to fade. So we'll get rid of that one. And we'll say, OK, let's add an action and say when you press on it, I want to trigger an animation. And that animation is my cup slide from the full down menu. Finish. Now, when that cup slide is complete, that's when we want to transition. So one thing Storyboard does for you is it automatically adds this event, cup slide animation complete. So you'll be notified when that animation is done. When that happens, I'll say save. And I'll move off to my brew screen as I did before. So with those couple of actions, we can then again simulate on our desktop. And what you'll see, we go start, we select small, it runs our animation, does our fade to the new screen. So that's how fast you can start building these effects and simulate it. Now, that's something very quickly I've done, but if you put the tool in the hands of someone with more power and more design, such as one of our graphics designers, I'll show you the example of what he has accomplished here. So if I have this, when I run this on my desktop, you'll see what he's got. Something is animating at all times. So there's always something going on here. I'll press start. Things fall off, pop in. So he's added far more advanced animations and effects than I would add. And this was all done by the same graphic designer who developed the files in Photoshop. And you can walk through the application, and everything has an animated feel and is really the, the high-end modern UI you're looking for. If we go back and look at our timelines for this particular system, you'll see they are much more complicated. So if we look at size, we'll see he has added many steps for all the elements he's moving around on the screen, all the different areas there. And then you can start manipulating this to really fine-tune your experience. If you were to look at something like this step, 
you'll see we have the duration and offsets. You can put your animation tweening rates. We even have an editor if you had a custom rate or feel that you were looking for, for your, to really make it your own experience, you can do that. So these are the things you can do extremely quickly in the storyboard design tool and get the, the feel you want. Now, a little later, we're going to push this down directly to a target, and you'll see that it's not just a prototype, but it's actually something usable on the target system. So what I want to do now is flip back to our presentation, and let's talk a bit more about embedding this and how you get it on the target. Um, one thing I'll review first is a couple of key points that were in there about storyboard. So as you've seen, we, we can import designs directly from Photoshop. Uh, that is very fast, uh, expedites your process. Another feature is the ability to re-import. So let's say we had our coffee machine and our designer decided, I want to reskin the whole thing. I would like to change all the icons or the colors. That used to be a long, onerous process. Now he can take that file, reskin it, hand it, or bring it in himself to the tool. And in a matter of a minute, the way you saw before, we'd reskin the whole app. Your logic, all your effects, they stay the same. You're just really reskinning the application. Uh, we saw the animation timeline and how quickly you could build up and tweak your experiences and build them. We also have Lua scripting built in, and that's an embedded scripting language you can use to do many features in the storyboard, from data changes to animations to business logic for your app. Another key feature for modern UIs is that design teams and development teams are distributed these days. It's no longer a single person working on something. You may even have multiple offices contributing content. So the collaboration between them is key. And one feature we have is the ability to compare and merge these changes to make sure you don't receive any regressions when you're committing your code. And you can see here, we'll show you a side-by-side -side view where you can visually analyze what's happening in your system. And, and lastly, a piece about rapid validation. So you've seen how quickly we can pull it in, visualize it, test it on your desktop. You can stimulate it. <clears throat> that exact same thing can go to a tablet device for testing and showing in a meeting. It can go directly to hardware, as you'll see. So you really have one tool to prototype to deployment. You're not switching out to a different tool when you hit the embedded system. So we're going to go now into the embedded side of things. So how do I actually deploy this to my target system and put storyboard in my MCU and my RTOS? So a couple of key points I'll start with here is that Storyboard is a runtime engine model, which means that from the design tool, you're not really exporting C and C++ code that you then have to build and recompile for all of your changes. We export a data deployment of your UI, or in our case, an embedded resource header, which we'll talk about in a bit. And we're also event-driven, so that means helps with power management. Um, it gives you a very clear way to inject elements into the system. And with our scalable exporting solution, whether you're a file system, embedded flash, it really gives you a lot of options to get the best UI and integration for your system. And again, today we're talking about the RT1050 platform, high performance MCU with low power consumption that's really going to let us leverage these animations that you've seen in this application. So some key concerns that always come up when you talk about how do I embed this UI into my, into my program. There's going to be memory requirements. How much memory do I actually need? Uh, how do I budget for that? Uh, the performance concerns on your target compared to your desktop system. System integration, so how do I actually talk to my real code? How do I make my UI real and do something? Uh, and last, we'll talk a bit about OS support and the flexibility of my system and how can I move from different areas. So we'll start with memory. So there's a few areas to memory that should be discussed and always come up. And one big one is the frame buffer. So when you're talking about doing any kind of UI access or uh, development, you really have to keep in mind that the LCD you put on and the amount of memory required is directly dependent on your display resolution. So in this example, we have a 480 by 272 display, and we're running at 16-bit color. So that means two bytes for every pixel on the screen. So if you do the math simply, you'll receive approximately 256 kilobytes of memory. And that's for a single buffer. So that means when you draw, you're actually looking at what you're drawing. And it's very capable to run that way. But depending on the animations you're going to do, you may see some issues with that, which you've 
often heard as seeing flicker or tearing in the display and elements like that. So for that reason, many people go to double buffering. And what double buffering really means is you have two frame buffers. So you can see that doubles to a 512 kilobyte of memory so that you're drawing to one area and looking at another. Now you can see in many systems that's going to exceed the amount of uh, tightly coupled memory and system memory you have. So that's why it's very good to actually budget and do the math for this to determine what size LCD and how your buffering is going to work before you put your app on. Again, oftentimes questions come up about additional layers on the screen and overlays. And just keep in mind that those also require extra frame buffer content and, and more RAM. Obviously, the second area of concern for memory is once you put Storyboard into your application, how much uh, memory does Storyboard use? So our engine code actually resides in flash memory. And as I stated, we don't export C code, but what we do is provide you a set of libraries and headers that you can integrate into your BSP project. Our typical footprint for our core is 120K, and that will be stored in flash. So that's not really RAM usage. That's going to be put in QSPY or HyperFlash or some other area of memory. And then you can add extend, ben, extendable sorry, plugins between 2 and 24K in size. And when I say 2 to 24, that really depends on what features you're using in your UI. So for example, Lua scripting I mentioned, optional component. Lua scripting plugin is around 24K. If you require that, you add it in. But again, you're putting this down into Flash. Then obviously there will be dynamic memory required for your UI. Uh, this is for the UI model and any dynamic data. It really depends on your complexity of your system. And you think about animations or moving elements on the screen. I'm updating text strings. I'm updating numeric values of data that I'm collecting in my UI. All of this requires read-write memory, so it's going to use RAM overhead. Uh, things like internationalization, where all of your strings will be changing at runtime. You may be changing icons at runtime. Uh, you'll need memory for those. Now, the good thing that happens here is that in Storyboard, we've developed a tool that can export a design report for you. And this helps you estimate the amount of RAM and flash you use based on your UI design. It will give you counts of how many elements are on your screen, uh, images you're using, fonts you're using, different sizes, and allow you to and help you to estimate those sizes so you can better budget your platform. Uh, another area for memory requirements of your HMI would be obviously the UI assets. So this is image data um, and fonts many times. So the image data, we give you the ability through Storyboard again to export directly to flash memory. And where that's powerful is if you think of our coffee machine that had a background image, that background image is 480 by 272. So we stated before that's going to use about 256K of memory, uh, which is a lot of RAM. However, Storyboard lets you export these directly to Flash to save that RAM content, and then we can draw directly from the Flash without an intermediary copy. We also give you a compression format to help you minimize the amount of Flash you need at the end of the day also. Uh, again, font data, we can export that directly to Flash memory, and the same is true for Storyboard, giving you the tools to export those, draw them directly from Flash, and actually change the format and the size to allow you to budget properly of Flash and RAM content. The next topic I'll discuss, performance. Um, and really performance is a lot of times comes down to frame rate and CPU utilization. So frame rate expectations, uh, as we know, should be really based on the target system. But what you're going to have is in Storyboard you've seen I can set a frame rate for each transition, each animation, and I can really tweak them independently depending on what I'm doing. So Storyboard gives you the ability to test it on your desktop, and then when you put it on the target system, we give you performance analysis tools to actually see how is this performing on my target, what frame rate am I achieving, where are the bottlenecks of my system, and how do I need to tweak that. You can then take that analysis data back to your target, make your changes, and allow you to really show you the experience on your desktop that you're getting on the target system and allow you to quickly change that so that you really are seeing exactly what you're seeing in both areas. We also have things like minimal redraw times based on damage area, um, the ability to accelerate hardware rendering depending on the system you're on for CPU offload. And all of these features will give you the power to achieve these frame rates on different targets. When we talk about system integration, uh, a couple of points here are that 
You want to embed Storyboard into your project, and here we're going to use the IAR development tools. But then, how easy is it to get it into my BSP? How do I get your tasks up and input and LCD configuration? So we're going to touch a bit more on them when we get into the demo in a couple of slides, so I'll leave that for now. But also, once you get Storyboard in it, I have my own back-end code on the system. I'm doing something real. How do I communicate with that, and how do I get that data into the UI? So we have some options. One is Lua scripting we've discussed. So Lua gives you the ability to quickly add operation logic to your system, uh, do some communication, make changes to the UI, and it's a very rich thing that allows you to integrate quickly. Also, you have your back-end communication. So what we have is Storyboard I.O. Storyboard I.O. gives you a communication channel and a task separation. So you can run your back-end task logic and the storyboard HMI logic in another task and communicate, send events and send data between the two. Um, and it also gives you the ability to separate the UI from the system logic, which will enhance your robustness to your system and your testability so you can test each piece independently. Now in Storyboard 5.2, another feature that is coming out will give you the ability from the design tool to where you're defining these events as you've seen and the data that's going to change in my UI, that's where I define it in Storyboard. But how do I send that to the embedded engineer? So we'll have a Storyboard I.O. connector that allows you to export that data for the embedded system developer, which will give them all the prototypes and data definitions in a header file and the code that they can then implement to allow them to easily communicate with each other and make sure there's nothing lost in that communication. Um, the last area we talked about was the uh, system independence, which is really talks about multi-platform. So in this example, we're going to be using free RTOS and the IR development tools <coughs> as our export. Storyboard is a multi-platform system. We're very OS independent. So we support, you can see here, things like ThreadX, MuCoS, you see Linux, you can even run on this RT platform, Linux, many other operating systems you'll see here. We can port easily to other OSs. But the application as itself does not change. So the same UI we've done on your host here, that doesn't have to change depending on your OS support because we're going to give you the piece at the end that you integrate into your BSP. Again, we're rendering agnostic. So in this example, we're going to be using a, a software or CPU rasterization where we do all the drawing ourselves. But if you had a system where you had some sort of 2D or even 3D in the future acceleration, we can quickly and easily extend out those parts to give you the CPU offload. Um, you'll get the same frame rates, but you'll have more CPU to do your own development and business logic. So what I'd like to do now is I'll jump over to a demo and show you how we actually integrate this into my platform and deploy it to the embedded target. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our copy application And we're going to export that for the embedded resource header. So if you look at this export panel for that application that my designer created, you'll have how are we going to export? Well, we're going to export an embedded resource header. You can also see here I've discussed you could do an Android application. Um, you could do a standalone launchers and the like. But for our system, we're going directly to Flash. We're going to do a res embedded resources. We're going to render our content directly from Flash or ROM. Uh, we're going to use 32-bit for our image data because some of them have transparency systems. Uh, you could also compress these. We're going to export our fonts. You can see the power that we have to tweak the sizes to allow you to really budget your flash properly. Uh, the name of the header file we're going to export to and the output directory, which happens to be my project that I'm using in IAR directly. So I'll hit run. It has exported the header and notify me it's complete. So now all we have to do is move over to our IAR development tool. And I have this project here, which is already set up. And in this project, it's incorporated a BSP for the platform, and it's already running on the board with FreeRTOS. So <clears throat> how do I get Storyboard into this? Well, this is very quick. Uh, we give you an SDK uh, with some basic entry points to allow you to very quickly get this in. Uh, the two main areas you would add, let's say to our main, which is already setting up our boot and our I2C, um, we can add in these two tasks. 
So there's the create storyboard engine function, sorry, not task, uh, task function, and the create storyboard input task. And this is really for input because we're using a touch screen today. You put these in, then you run the free RTOF scheduler. So what you'll see very quickly, we'll go into this code in a bit more in depth in a moment, but you'll see in this example, we have in the storyboard engine task that we've supplied to you in the SDK, we're including our model, which is the header resource header that we just exported from the storyboard development tool. So what we can do is we can compile this program And we'll just wait a moment here while it dates the build and does your comp compilation. Linking complete, no errors. So now we can deploy directly to the target. So I'm going to turn on our webcam here. So you can actually see the target platform. Target platform does not currently have any application running. Then I'm going to hit download and debug, which is going to, going to put it directly to the embedded target. Sorry. Just downloading it to the target and flash at this moment. So there we go. Now we're stopped at main. So we will just execute this. So now you can see my same application is running on the embedded system. Uh, we're still getting all the animations that we had in our desktop. We didn't have to make any code changes or do any changes there. So I can quickly step through the application so you can see it's fully functional the same way it was on my desktop system. I'll select the medium icon. All the animations are there, all the effects, brew and you can watch your coffee brew. So <clears throat> as you can see, we very quickly, we took it from Photoshop, uh, we imported it in the development tool, we can add all of our effects, but the same thing we've done on our desktop system is deployable to the target and does run in the same way. You didn't have to recode your application once you went to the target or re-implement it. Um, you really can go from your prototype directly to the deployment platform. So if we dig a bit deeper into the code that we had to implement, it's a very small amount of code. So we talked about a few main functions here. I'm going to turn off the webcam momentarily here. So there's a few main functions. So we talked about the storyboard input task. And really what that is is called free our task task for create for our input task. And we provided a sample input task for any platforms that we ship for support. And this is really an area for you to make changes if you had to. In our case, we're reading from the touch screen and injecting storyboard events. So you can see here, we're going to send an event. We're sending motion events, a press event, and so on, uh, a release event, just with the data received from the touch screen. So if you had a different touch screen in your system, you can make these changes here and determine how that works. The second function that we had to implement Is, and we shipped it to you as a sample, is the create storyboard engine task. And this really creates a storyboard main task in your system, which will run your UI. Again, free our top task create. And you'll see here that we ended up running our storyboard app, which is very easy. We create the application, uh, we can set some debug flags, and we call run, which really is running our own internal event loop to allow it to render the UI, process external events and internal events, and get that going. And this again is provided for you. The only other two callouts that would be required for your system and are provided again for the RT platform as examples for you to run on the reference board is how do I initialize my display? So we have this callout uh, display init where you can implement your own code and we've given it to you for the reference platform. So if you were to change the LCD or change the resolution of the color depth, you want to easily make these changes to your system, but you don't want to have to deal with the rendering code. We've dealt with the hard part there for you. So what you can do is you go in here and you could edit your changes. You'll see we've set up the pixel clock, initialize the LCD. Um, we're allocating the frame buffers for the code, uh, the size of the frame buffers, giving the addresses the width and height back and all of those elements. 
and that feeds back into our rendering engine so we know what we're drawing to and we make sure things are proper. Uh, the second function is once you've completed your rendering, we're going to update the display and we've talked about double buffering in the system. So that means we're going to render to one of your frame buffers and then later we're going to flip and show that one. So it's a call out to allow you to do that depending on your platform and the LCD you're using. So in this case we have the initialization code which will set up the display, make sure it's turned on and everyone can see it. And then really you're switching to the set buffer address which is the next address um, for the other buffer and you're going to flip back and forth. So you can see it's a very small amount of code that you'd have to implement into your existing main program in order to get Storyboard and your UI running on the target system. Then later you would add in your own external code, your backend system tasks, and you can use the Storyboard I.O. to communicate back and forth between the two in a very basic and streamlined manner. It really allows you to quickly prototype and push your design to the target, then debug and test on your target system and feed that back into your design. So, uh, hopefully you've seen today how quickly you could move uh, a UI on your target device and move up down to, and move down to your MCU platform using Storyboard, uh, and really take advantage of the features of that platform. But not only that but the power of a high-level development tool to actually target these platforms. Um, we'll now open it up uh, to Jenny for any questions that have come in. All right, we did have a couple of questions come in, and if anybody has any others, you can just use the questions tab. <clears throat> Brian, can I export and run my application from an SD card? And I believe that. Yes, so currently on this demo application, we're exporting an embedded resource header. And what that does is it puts all of your content into flash memory. However, this platform also has an SD card slot, and what you could do is also export it to SD card. What you would do is put the storyboard engine in your BSP, you still write that to flash. So that code I talked about that resides in flash is still there. However, when you export the storyboard deployment model, and if I go back to our development tool here, you would then choose to export what we call the Storyboard Embedded Engine or GAP. And what that is is a file system version. So you put a file system on your SD card, you would export your application there, and then we would load it directly from SD card. So all your code is still in Flash, but your application content is in SD card. The interesting piece of this is it would allow you to quickly iterate designs. Because right now, as you change content in the design tool, if we change this background image and such, we have to export it and rebuild with IAR because we're writing everything to Flash. So you actually have to recompile that into the Flash code. However, if you put your application in the SD card, it would give you the ability to quickly make changes in your UI, write it to the SD card, put the SD card in, reset the platform, immediately see your results. You would not have to go to IAR development tools for any of that. Uh, process which would very quickly and easily allow someone like even a graphics designer who's using the tool that doesn't know how to use IAR to be testing on the platform and see their impact immediately. All right. Can I write my own code for rendering content? Yes. So currently what we're using is the Storyboard uh, Software Rasterizer or Software Renderer. And if you wanted to, a couple of things can happen here. You may want to extend out certain features of that and take advantage of, let's say you put an FPGA or some optimized lit routine on your system that you wanted to use. Uh, in our SDK, we can give you the ability to call those out and render different areas of the code if you wanted to in your own manner. The second thing we have as part of our SDK is the ability for you to contribute your own render extensions. So, Currently, you'll see in this list, I have things like text controls, image controls, fills, polygons, circles. If you had your own content that you wanted to use, then you could use our SDK, contribute your own render extension for the system that draws your own custom content, incorporate that in and build it, but also in Storyboard Designer, you can add a template in for your custom control. So it would show up in this list. And 
people will be able to drag it out and actually add actions and events to it. So it allows you to not only extend the runtime system, but the designer tool also to meet your needs. All right, here's one that we tend to get quite a bit. Does Storyboard run without an OS on bare metal? So Storyboard does require some level of operating system at the end of the day. Uh, in this example, we are using FreeRTOS as our OS. Uh, and the reason for that is at some point, you need to uh, create tasks, create uh, synchronization primitives, you need to allocate memory in all these areas. And you also need to bring up the target system. So you need to get the board up and running. And at some level of BSP, we'll be doing that development code. So in order to incorporate Storyboard into these programs, that would have to be written. And you know that could be, instead of bare metal, a lot of times what I see is when people say bare metal, they mean we've written our own set of task primitives and our own custom rendering back end. And how do you take advantage of that? So it's not necessarily totally bare metal, but it's that area. So in that case, yes, we can definitely take advantage of those areas. We have a very uh, clean abstraction layer for handling OS primitives. And as you've seen earlier, we support numerous levels of OSs, and we can quickly extend out. So with adding the features to call in to your own task creation, um, how do I create a mutex, and areas like that for synchronization primitives, some sort of timing source. And we can extend that in a matter of weeks, usually, out to a platform and be running on your custom system. Is the runtime engine the same for different operating systems? Yes. Uh, well, let's say 90% of it is the same for different operating systems. Um, because the runtime engine core code is our core engine code that is recompiled depending on the tool chain the operating system, the rendering back end of your target. So all of that code is identical, and let's say 90% or possibly even more would be identical depending on the system you're using. The differences between different operating systems that would occur is the actual abstraction out. So how do I create a task? Uh, how do I create a synchronization variable? Things like that. And what we've done is abstracted that away, so that is a very small amount of the actual code being used. And that way, when you're testing, and we're running our regression testing on multiple OSs, you're leveraging the fact that all of that code has been tested on multiple platforms, and it's really the only change being made is the custom code for your, rent, your OS technology. Now, on the other side, there's also could be differences in rendering, too, by that accord, because if you use our software rendering technology, that is the same across all platforms we support when you use that mode. The only difference would be the callouts I showed you for something like how I set up my LCD. However, if you wanted us to take advantage of some custom 2D accelerator, then that code would be expanded and included in the design. But again, that's a very small area of code, all of your regular logic for how do I handle events, how do I deal with the internal data model of Storyboard, how do I interface with Storyboard I.O. and other communication mechanisms, the Lewis Script Interpreter, this is all common code through the engine for all platforms we support and has been optimized in, to uh, do that. All right. If I make some modifications to the original Photoshop PSD, can Storyboard import it without affecting the effects that I've already made? Yes. So I mentioned the Storyboard re-import feature. So you have this uh, button here that is Storyboard re-import. Unfortunately, on this laptop, I don't have a uh, Photoshop file to do it. But if we were to take this application, it already has all of these animations and the actions you've seen, what happens when I press on things tied to it. If you re-import the Photoshop file, all of those connections remain intact. Really what you're doing, you're going to pull in the new content. And, and it will step you through a process of, do you want to pull in new icons, new images, new colors? Then the next phase is, do you want to include uh, re-layout of options? So you could decide when I import the new Photoshop file, well, these were all these icons were moved up on the screen. Not only were they changed, but they were moved in position. Um, you'll also get that content that will come in. And 
Another area would be new elements. So if new icons were added to the screen by your designer, it will ask, would you like to add the new elements? You can then quickly step through that process, incorporate everything, but all the existing connections to your elements are the same. So if we imported a new coffee machine, you could run it again, see all the animations, all the effects you've already seen. It'll just have a new layout or a new skinning or theme there at the end. So it really allows you to be working through the process of getting your application completed, doing your integration, and allow your designers the ability to make changes after they've seen it on hardware. Maybe depending on the LCD, they don't feel that the color scheme worked quite properly, or there's different changes they wanted to make there. And you can quickly make them even at the last moment and not really impact your product release schedule. Uh, one more here, um, and we're probably out of time. So following on to the question about the uh, operating system, do you purchase a license for the specific OS? No. So we sell Storyboard as a development seat that you would purchase for your project, and then you would buy a specific SDK um, for your target platform. So the development seat so if I understand your question correctly, development seed is can be used for any product you actually ship. So you can use that to build one design, another design, different products, different things. Then the SDK, obviously you would have to get a different SDK per platform because if you're running one uh, OS such as FreeRTOS, you would get that SDK for FreeRTOS. If you later use ThreadX, you'd have to get a second SDK for ThreadX. So those will have to change because we give you pre-compiled modules for those different pieces. However, the development tool and how you design does not change in between any of those systems. All right, I think we're out of time. Uh, so if there are any other questions, and I see a few more that are in here that we didn't get to, we'll respond separately on those. And just note that this has been recorded today, so we will be sending an email later this week or early next week with a link to the webinar recording. Thanks so much for giving us part of your day. Have a good day.